So, there can be what I am trying to say is that in a typically in, a, in, a, in an industrial scenario you can have various kinds of optimization criterion. Second thing is the second thing which is important for uh, for a uh, for a production is that you know process variability that is typically you want to maintain a certain set point you are holding and but still the process signals or the process uh, final product parameter let us say a let us say a steel strip thickness steel strip thickness coming out of a rolling mill you have the same roll gap. So, you want that uh, a steel bar comes of a certain uh, width and when it gets rolled it should come out with a with a with a certain level of thickness right. So, you have accordingly you have set your accordingly you have set your roll gap right. So, this gap is gap between the two rolls you have set. So, your set point is fixed, but it turns out that there can be enormous variations in I mean there can be quite a bit variations in roll gaps depending on other factors for example, the temperature of the bar which is entering. So, if the bar is heated to the appropriate temperature it will get rolled easily. If the bar is not heated if the bar has cooled down little bit because it was waiting to be rolled for some time. So, its temperature has fallen down then it will become considerably harder to roll and therefore, the uh, dimension reduction may not be appropriate right. So, such things can give a lot of process variability and <coughs> you know once you have a once you have a good see you want for 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 the product to sell you need a certain quality finally. So, in the case of sometimes if you have if you are storing in tanks as we have said that as you are storing in tanks and if you have widely fluctuating product quality then you actually need a large tank such that all these variations when you when they get when they actually come to the tank and finally, get mixed then they come to an average quality. So, if you may have a small tank then obviously, integration over smaller time of a sinusoid will give a will give will still give variations. So, if you want to reduce variation you will need to have large tanks. On the other hand in the case of discrete manufacturing you are not e each piece is actually different. So, the so it is so not that if you uh, you know manufacture more length of steel plates then you can tolerate certain certain kind of variations. I mean variations on one part will not cancel the other. <coughs> so, in such a case you know you you have to you have to for example, suppose a suppose a railway wheel it has to have a certain amount of weight. Now, if you if you if you are if if now when you are cutting an ingot you are first cutting an ingot and then shaping the ingot in the in the form of a wheel. Now, when you are cutting the ingot if you if you cannot cut precise amounts of material then what is going to happen is that you will always play safe because you do not if, if it becomes of less volume or weight then it will be totally rejected. So, you will try to play safe and you will actually set your limit higher. So, you will cut more material then finally, that 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 additional material will have to be machined and you are not only going to waste material again, but you are going to waste machine time. So, if you have high variability generally you do not have good uh, performance of processes. And variability big variability generally comes for various kinds of uh, problems in processes like common problems which occur like for sensors they may have there, there may be improper calibration, improper calibration will directly result in uh, dimensional inaccuracy. If you have noise then because of noise feedback things will <coughs> there will be uh, perturbations in the output. Similarly, thermo wells when they get clogged they they actually can insert quite a bit of time constant and therefore, especially when you have when you have uh, shifting uh, set points then the process will not track the set point well as we have learnt. Similarly, plugged lines can give plug lines means all the sensors will actually sense. So, maybe you are you are sensing a pressure sensor and you have a you have a line which actually connects the process to the meter and senses the pressure. Now, this this line if it is plugged then the pressure will not be properly sensed and the sensor will give bad readings and sensor readings prop as we have seen earlier that sensor readings sensor errors in control systems directly affect the output. 
So, if you have any problem in the sensor, it is going to be directly trans transferred to your output. Similarly, you could have actuator problems, various kinds of problems like friction due to lack of lubrications, then actuators also have sensors. So, there may be problems there. There may be problems of electronics or problems of sealing. Sometimes, you know, fluids will leak, say hydraulic systems or problems of power sources. For example, suppose you have a pneumatic actuator and if you have if you have less air pressure or you have a hydraulic actuator and your hydraulic pump pressure has fallen. So, such problems give you give problems in the actuator. These are you know very typical problems. Similarly, controller may, may be may be may be badly tuned, right? And similar and of course the process can develop leaks, it can develop you know scales on on heat transfer equipment, things can get clogged. So, all sorts of all these kinds of problems can occur and these prob these problems generally make the performance of the control loop inferior. So, one needs to all the time check whether the control system is actually performing adequately. So, that is the basic job of process monitoring. So, you have process monitoring. Uh, so, the basic job of process there, there are you can you, you can you can you can divide process monitoring into two ways one is performance monitoring and the other one is oh the other one is failure detection or diagnosis so when you are doing performance monitoring then you are ensuring that process variables are within specified limits so you are so, no limits are being crossed, quality will be ok. And you are also ensuring that, that other key performance indicators, for example, energy being spent or compositions of waste compositions, etcetera, or uh, you know, so scrap, the amount of scrap or the amount of raw material that you are consuming per unit product, this could be you know key performance indicators. Uh, or the loop dynamic performance, these are within limits. So, while you are, you are doing performance audit and monitoring, you are trying to look for better optimization opportunities, but as such the plant is operating ok. Contrasted to that, you have a situation where there where something goes wrong, something breaks. So, there are, there, are, there are abnormal process operations and then you have to diagnose the root cause early enough for correction, so that the it can be corrected and the operation does not get jeopardized. So, these are the two kinds of functionality, main functionality for process monitoring. Process variability checking, this is a standard control chart. So, you take lots and then you from this, those lots you actually calculate means, mean values and then you plot the mean values and you continuously try to see. So, you have decided some upper control limit and some lower control limit and you try to see the, how, that whether the mean values are actually contained within that. In, in some cases they may go out, if they go out that is cause for concern, if they go out too often then they are cause for really cause for concern and you need and you know that your process variability has increased, right. So, the process is not being able to follow a particular kind of you know output properties, but the output properties are varying and there is a lot of variability. So, which means that something has gone wrong, right. Uh, so, you need typically you check process variability using such such charts. Often process monitoring why we are showing this diagram is that in, in many many cases process monitoring is actually done by uh, expert operators. So, there is always a question of you know having man machine interfaces and there are lots of issues in their designs like for example, previously older older this this is a this is a typically it looks like a power plant power substation this is a pass you know here here is a bus here is the bus here are the various feeders this is a probably some sort of a machine. So, you have these are various meters then you have relays at the back and things like that. So, you see that these uh, th these are you know a panel, these are called control panels. 
or mimic panels sometimes. So previously what we used to have you know such mainly such man machine interfaces where the so you have big big meters and the they are so now the design of these have to be such that the that it is you know easily problems see an operator looks at hundreds of these meters in, so they have to be properly color coded so that so an operator can from a distance he can quickly make out what is the source of the problem their placements more important things should be right in front of the operator then the various controls should be such that the operator the operator can very closely operate it so you have you know various kinds of joysticks and uh, other controls where the, where the operator can can conveniently give manual control commands of course graphics audio visual clues alarm annunciations so some lights glowing some hooters and proper labeling that is each variable should be properly labeled so that the operator can quickly make out the situation so there's a lot of you know these are called you know human factor engineering human factor engineering sometimes referred to as ergonomics ergonomics so there are so a lot of such thoughts go into the design of such uh, man machine interfaces on the other hand if you see some modern interfaces many of it will be often will be for example you can see here that apart from these the operators will have computers so there will be you know vdu or crt based displays which will also show th these are the modern kinds of uh, man machine interfaces typically a man machine interface shows to the operator these three things it shows the current state of the process it shows alarms and events and it lets the operator compare performance against trends and history. So these are the three kinds of information that a man machine interface, a modern man machine interface based on computers makes available to the operator. So these are so it these are the major functions of man machine interfaces data acquisition and display then measure and processing it, it, it calculates the various derived values that is it does not of always produce raw data to the to the um, operator because that the the raw data uh, does not is sometimes require further processing to give more meaningful operation uh, information to the operator for uh, you know effective uh, plant operation and management so such measurement processing will go on. And uh, so, measure and processing, then events and alarms. So it will clearly show the events and alarms, their sequences, uh, then etc. So, how the things are happening, what, when, which uh, signal has reached some high or low level. So, all these things, so all the sequence of events that are happening in the system, it lets the operator see it it maintains a history database and log generate logs and reports it also takes the operator commands and applies it to the plant and finally it integrates with the higher layers of automation like for example in this case which will be a <coughs> which may be a manufacturing execution system so these are the main functions of uh, now it turns out that as you as you have seen from the previous picture that there are hundreds and sometimes maybe close to a thousand variables and loops that the op that an operator may be required to monitor so there's a need for you know it is very difficult and there's a, there's a need for automated monitoring and therefore uh, purely manual monitoring requires lots and lots of experience and even then uh, operator errors are not cannot be ruled out and have occurred in various various situations just like they occur in aircraft accidents aircraft accidents also the pilot has to see a whole lot of uh, signals and take very very time critical decisions so the control performance monitoring automated control performance monitoring actually basically tries to determine whether the control system is performing satisfactorily if not then to diagnose causes of unsatisfactory performance and then finally it 
generates action which could be retuning of controllers or it could be activating special shutdown or emergency procedures. So, this is the basic idea of performance monitoring. Now, if you want to monitor, if you want to basically determine whether, 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 whether something is going wrong, then uh, just a moment. Uh oh. <coughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. interface. Then, yeah. So we have seen this one. So yeah, what I was saying is that if you want to find out whether a plant is working perfectly then you need to do two things firstly you need to uh, check with a benchmark you know something whether it's good enough so first of all you have to determine so you have to first of all look at some quantity so what are the quantities that you are going to look at to understand whether the plant is performing properly so so, so you need to select some response parameters or some performance indicator and then you need to check whether its its value is okay so you are, so you need to define what is okay and what is good enough? So, that is called a benchmark. So, what you do is, so you could be have various kinds of benchmark. For example, you could have response parameters like rise time, settling time, overshoots, offsets, integral error criteria. So, all these could serve as benchmarks. So, if you have a too high an overshoot, then you know that there is something wrong and one of the reasons could be that the loop delay has increased. For some reason, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the sensor um, sensor thermo well has accumulated some material. So, this so the sensor lag has increased and therefore, you are, you are getting too much overshoot because the overall loop phase has increased, right. Similarly, you could you could calculate some certain signals and we will we'll see what this in little more detail. You can if you have a if you have a model of the process, I mean a dynamic model which could be described in various mathematical terms, then you could generate you know a residual. That is, you could you can generate a signal that as long as the system and the model are, are close enough, then that signal will be is going to be small. If the system deviates from the model, then this, this signal will grow up, and then you can try to look at that model. Uh, you can try to look at that residual, or you can look at you can uh, even look at historical data. You know, you can look at historical data saying that, and which you know that this is satisfactory performance. So you, can, so, you can always compare. So, suppose some maintenance was done in the plant and immediately after that you know that the plant was working fine. So, if you have the historical op operational data stored with that, you can always compare with that and th then that can also serve as a benchmark, right. So, there are various ways that this process monitoring can be done. You can try to monitor various things like production volume, production quality. For example, you can strip quality tracking in rolling mills or ladle tracking for continuous casting because so that you know that uh, you, you, you can achieve a certain amount of certain number of you know heats uh, in a continuous caster. This, this, is, this was actually a problem for uh, our steel industry that they were not being they were not having enough. Uh, number of heats. Similarly, you can have equipment health or performance characteristics like you know you can have you can you can actually monitor machine tools whether they have got worn out. You can have fire brick linings check check fire brick linings of furnaces. Similarly, you can check monitor process operations like you know detect detect when when you are pouring metal when, when slag is going to come or not and etc etc. So, you can monitor various kinds of quantities. <coughs> So, as, you, as I said that how to monitor a process, you compare a process signal or some other signal derived from, from them with their expected or normal patterns. So, expected or normal pattern you have to calculate. Then how to obtain expected or normal patterns? Either by checking threshold high and low limits which you have already set or by checking material and energy balance errors. So, for, for example, if you know that the mass of material which is going out is 
<coughs> so, so the mass of fluid which is going in and the mass of fluid which is going out are not matching that then there could be a leak in the equipment. You can check certain parameters like heat transfer coefficients if, if, a, if, if a tube develops scales then the heat transfer coefficient is going to fall or you can also sometimes check sensor failures by physical redundancy you have more number of sensors so you check whether they are their readings are tallying. So, so you know that if, if, if one of them is not tallying then you know that that sensor is faulty. So, you can have several such ways of uh, monitoring the process signals. So, you have you continuously look at the process signals which you are acquiring and then using various kinds of physical models or, or various kinds of experimental models which are mathematical models. You can do computation which will which can tell you whether the behavior of the process is as expected uh, in terms uh, in terms of performance. So, I will skip this little bit this says that the residual signal model based residual should be calculated such that when there is no fault then the residual is going to be very small. The moment there will be a failure this residual will grow up and so looking at the residual you can determine whether there is a failure in the plant. <coughs> so, residuals can be generated by various ways various kinds of signal processing algorithms we do not have time to discuss the, those. We will skip this and before I leave this level 2. So, we were discussing level 2 and I would like to say that all these you know both the optimization of set points as well as you know uh, um, process monitoring uh, require a lot of knowledge. So, you have to have good process databases and you and you also have a good knowledge base so that you can actually uh, perform this computation. So, this operation and process databases are very 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 important components of uh, supervisory control. Now, we come to lev level 3 automation basic functions are material and production tracking. So, how the production is actually taking place with respect to a certain order material handling and production procedures how the material will actually move from one machine to to another machine what will be the sequence first milling then turning then boring or what. So, the actual production procedures then <coughs> resource management and allocation how many machines you have which how many are you, you are you are going to allocate to what what batches and what orders production dispatching. So, so finally, when you when you determine them then finally, dispatching these to the lower level for actual production data collection and quality assurance. So, assure that from the from the from the data that you have got from the uh, supervisory control level as well as from the I mean quality shop ensure that you ha you are meeting quality standards which you have which are required. And finally, overall performance analysis the plant audits in terms of material consumption, energy consumption, costs per unit cost etcetera. So, all these are typically done at the manufacturing automation levels document management. Document management is a very important part of modern uh, you know standards. So, for all these things for all this doing all these you have manufacturing execution systems which are computer systems which let you do all that. So, basically this is exactly what is being said that the manufacturing automation system this I also said earlier that the manufacturing automation system actually sits between the business system and the shop floor automation. So, it takes the business system requirements and targets and then generates in turn generates the targets which can be then sent over to the shop floor automation system which is going to actually meet those targets in terms of volume and, qual and quality and you know efficiency of production. And that process is actually basically short term planning and scheduling. So, in short term pla planning you planning is, is, is something which you do in, uh, in the business system typically that is in level 4. And so, you make choices with respect to order acceptance, capacity planning, delivery times at sites etcetera and then you take these short term plans and then you further augment them with actual production sequences, production times, route through the machines etcetera and then you you also you know elaborate them you know kind of week by week, day by day. So, that you have a much more detailed schedule. So, these are the differences between basically scheduling is also planning but over a longer horizon and with respect to a with respect to the 
equipment which you are going to deploy. So, typically this is production scheduling. So, you determine you, you, you want to determine production amounts that means lots and batch sizes and you are given the planning horizon and the demand from the inventories. So, so how much is going to be required, how much you can store, over, over what time you should plan. If you are given these then you product you plan the lot and batch sizes. You can plan timings of operations, the run lengths that is each set of batches how, how you are going to run them and that you need to you need that you can actually determine if you know the precedence order in which the machining has to be done and the resource utilization. So, similarly you can determine this the how you are going to at, at, at which sites you are going to produce these using which units, which equipment items etcetera. Okay? So, this is what you essentially do in production scheduling. Now, if you take a finally we are we are going to take a we have we, we have to we have, we have to take a uh, when we go to higher and higher then we have to take an integrated view of the of the business and that is sometimes modeled as a supply chain so you have on the one hand you have or, we have the we have the orders and based on the orders you have to do resource planning and you have to actually make your raw material logistics that is how you are going to procure the materials <coughs> that that you are going to transform to fi uh, finished products. Similarly, you have to have you know you have to create the facility for production which can come from you know R and D basic engineering and then construction. So, you have to do capacity planning, you have to do actually act actually manufacturing resources you have to put together. So, once you bring the raw material and the and the manufacturing resources then you can actually do production, here you can do production. So, this is this is the place where you do production and then then once you have pro the production then you have to you have finally it has to start with the order and it has to end with the delivery right and all these all these dcs supervisory control actually work in only in this part there is the, these parts are still managed by the enterprise or the or the business systems uh, which uh, take the product and uh, finally, I mean ensure that the uh, order to delivery sequence actually takes place. So, this is and obviously, if you if if you have if you manage want to manage the whole supply chain, then it requires actually basic basic coordination between these systems which are you know sometimes called business systems, business systems and these are the MES and the DCS, manufacturing execution systems and the distribution control systems. Uh, distributed control systems and, the, and these are the B2B systems. So, these systems obviously require synchronized business and manufacturing systems. So, the this is the essence of it that they have to be synchronized and they have to be integrated for ultimate coordination, right. So, that is why you need to, so all these, so as we have told we do we not, do not need to elaborate this that, so the the enterprise level system typically decides on the business parts, long term planning, finance, human resource and sets production goals, capacity plans etcetera and this. So, basically they all they are also trying to do optimization, they are also trying to do uh, planning and so if you, so at that level you do what is known as enterprise resource planning. So, <coughs> and, and then these 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 enterprise resource plans have to be finally taken up by the manufacturing execution plan and then actually the actually the man, they have to optimize them so that you get the response so the erp system actually says that what kind of response is is desired and the manufacturing execution system creates plans for lower level systems such that such response can be generated right so they need to be obviously be very integrated and this integration can can actually be in both directions that is there can be vertical integration right from the you know enterprise systems down to the automatic I mean, supervisory control automatic control. So, that is vertical integration down to the machine that actually produces it and they also require horizontal integration in the sense that you need to integrate your 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 activities over different sites between between warehouses factories right. So, so that is special integration that is called horizontal integration. 
So you need integration on both sides. We will skip these because we are running out of time. So finally, I would like to just comment that for, for making all that happen, you need actually a lot of intelligent automation and therefore you need a lot of deployment of industrial technologies. Finally, lesson, lesson review. So in this lesson, we have talked about the basically the in brief, we have tried to scan the three levels, level two, level three and level four automation. And finally, you have some points to ponder. You can <coughs> describe the levels of functional hierarchy, name three major functions. This basically describe how, how to generate residuals, etc. So that's all for today. Thank you very much.